Okay, we are ready technically for the transmission. So at 10 a.m., please, uh, Juan, let's begin the conference. One minute. Asian time. <laughs> I <Okay>. should be excited. <laughs> so um, now, please uh, turn off uh, your microphones and video so we, we can have more uh, net network and available for that meeting. Welcome to everybody. Uh, this is a uh, Asia Center study event and venue. So now we have uh, uh, the title, US-China Relation, A New Cold War, that is in chair of uh, Professor Carlos Aquino. The now the time is 10 a.m. It's o'clock. The transmission was uh, is by, by Zoom and Facebook. Uh, in charge of, of Asia Center study page. So now we have uh, Professor Robert Daly, which is the director of, of Kirchner Institute. Uh, now we will have uh, Professor Aquino. Uh, Professor Aquino? Uh, yes. Yes, you, you can present the Asia Center study, please. Okay, thanks, uh, one deal. Okay, I will make a small introduction of our center. Uh, first of all, uh, good morning to everybody, and good morning to Professor Robert Daly, thanks for your time. Uh, yes, I mean, there are some people who are coming in. Okay, yeah, this is our center of, you, you are seeing my presentation, okay? This is yes. our center, okay. This is our center of Asian studies. We. Uh, the Center of Asian Study is part of San Marcos National University. It was established uh, in November 2018. The aim of the center is to the aim of the center is to well to, today we have this presentation. The aim of the center is to study the Asian region that is having a more increasing importance uh, to all over the world and also for Peru. Just to give a figure, last uh, year we have uh, 46, 47 percent of Peruvian export of goods went to Asia, and also uh, China is the uh, most important partner. But not only China, Korea, Japan, and even India are among the seven most important partners of Peru. Also, China, as other Asian countries, are uh, becoming the biggest investor in Peru. Okay? So for, for this aim to study the Asian region, the Center of Asian Studies, we have a team of researchers, several of whom have done professional studies in China, India, South Korea, and Japan. Um, this is the objective of our center, specifically is to study the region, to gain a better understanding of this region, to propose public policies in order for Peru to take advantage of the opportunities offered by that region. For that, we do a several kind of activities, and one of the activities is the conference that we're having today with Professor Robert Dahl. Uh, in August, we have been very busy, especially. We have, uh, this is the third conference that we have in August with Professor Robert Dahl. Dali, I want just to call your attention to the following two conferences on on this Friday 40, we're having a conference by an Indian scholar about the Gandhian way. And on Monday in 70, we'll have a Chinese professor from Fudan University who is going to talk about China political system. And the seven conferences that I want to call your attention on August 28th, Friday, we are going to have Carlos Vasquez, Peruvian ambassador in Singapore. He will talk about Asian perspective in the new uh, global context, okay? So uh, these uh, are the activities that we have in our center. This is the following one in Friday and 14, and this is the following one on Monday and 70. And I want you to remember that all our conference, uh, we record it, and uh, you can see it again in the uh, Facebook page of our Center of Asian Studies, and also we, you can follow us in our social media. We have blog, we have Twitter, we have all uh, social media available now, okay? So uh, this is uh, all, and I return again the conduction to Juan Diego, please. Thank you, Professor Aquino. Uh, 
only regarding that information of Professor Aquino, which is uh, was a scholarship from Japan. Uh, he was studying Kobe University, uh, uh, international economies and Asia economy. Uh, he, he was the first uh, translator for Egypt, Japanese to, to Spanish in Peru. He was also uh, working with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Peru. He is uh, now a, a coordinator of Asset Center Study, which is a strategy for internationalization for the National University of San Marcos, uh, focused on Asia, because we will have a great importance in, in Peru. He is also a vice director of vice the, vice president of the School of Economics in in this in this in the School of Economics in the National University of San Marcos. He was a visiting professor in many universities, as a, for example, Toho Haoqing, Chung Hising, Tam Tamkang de Taiwan, and uh, he was also in chair of Vision Group of Asia. APEC, you know, for, uh, the e Economic Forum of Latin America and East Asia. East Asia. He was also condecorated uh, by the government of Japan in, in 19, uh, yes, in, in 2012. He is an economist by National University of San Marcos. Uh, please let me introduce to all of you uh, the director of Wilson Center Kishner, Kishner Institute of China and the United States have complied an, an unusual diverse of portfolio of high level work. He has served as US diplomat in Beijing as an interpreter of Chinese and US leaders, including, including President Carter and Secretary of State Kishner, head of China programs and job Hawkins, is Syracuse, and the University of Maryland. And as a producer of Chinese language verses of Sesame Street, recognized East and West and leading authorities Sino-US relation. He has testified before Congress, lecture, white in both country, and regularly offered analysis for the top media studies. Welcome, Professor Robert Daly. And this is your meeting now. Let me introduce also um, Professor uh, Maria Osterloh. We have a few comments about the presentation. Maria Osterloh, let me say some, uh, some words about Maria Osterloh. She was, she is also a research of, of asset center study in National University of San Marcos. She also worked in the, uh, a political Andean studies. She's also she's also a research. She's also a, a research assistant at National University of San Marcos, dedicated to to studies international trade, sustainable development, and cultural sector. She has an MBA of National uh, Normal University uh, in China, uh, and he will she will participate in this meeting. Also, we have uh, Ana Gabriela Marcilla, uh, which is a CEO of Connect Latin Asia, also a professor of our university, National University of San Marcos. He was working as a corporate, corporate lawyer in, in China, the division of one company, the group uh, of one company who is dedicated to foreign trade law and foreign investment. She is also in chair of um, uh, one courses in, in, in Peru in the undergraduate courses and master courses. Uh, she also study in the National Chenchi University in Taiwan, it's a program of MBA. So now we, we have um, two members of ASE Center study that will be comment uh, your uh, presentation, Professor uh, Robert Daly. So, prof, uh, uh, Professor Carlos Aquino, maybe you can. Uh, yeah. Um, yes. Okay. Okay. Up. Thanks, Juan Tio. Okay, Professor. Then we will have your presentation. After your presentation, 
Ms. Gabriela Mancia and Mrs. Maria Osterlo will give some comments or questions, and then you can answer or comment on that, and then we open the floor to the question and answer session, if that is the case, okay? Please, Robert Daly, go ahead. Okay, well, uh, thank you very, very much, Professor Kino, and thanks to all of you for tuning in this morning. I'm honored to have this chance to speak with all of you, uh, and I'm very much looking forward to your comments. I have a, a great deal to learn about this really very important field of China's relations, uh, not only with Peru, but with all of Latin America. I was very excited uh, to get this invitation. I'm sorry that I cannot present it to you in Spanish. Uh, 33 years ago, I could speak Spanish fairly well. I could read well. I used to read Borges in the original. And then as soon as I started studying Chinese, it just pushed Spanish right out the window. It's, it's, it's terribly embarrassing. I've studied it all through high school and college, uh, but I'm afraid it is, it is largely gone, to, absent to me now. Uh, I have had the fortune uh, over the past, uh, over 10 years now, to look at, at sort of Peruvian, Chinese, and American relations indirectly, uh, because I've worked very, very closely with Wallace Lowe. I don't know if any of you know Wallace Lowe, uh, but he is a very proud, as he would say, Peruvian American of Chinese extraction. Born in Shanghai, grew up in Peru, uh, and then became the president of the University of Maryland. Uh, and I've worked very closely with him as an advisor. And so through him, I've, I've been made even more deeply aware of you know, the great impact of some of the Chinese and other Asian Peruvian communities uh, that, that are in Lima and other places. And so I'm especially because of my friendship with him, I'm glad to have a chance to speak with all of you. I thought, uh, having discussed this with Professor Aquino, that I would cover uh, four areas briefly before our discussion. One is the nature of US-China relations, which is dynamic, it's changing. Second, I'd like to address, because I think this is of interest and it's of importance to other countries, uh, the blame game that we see between the United States and Beijing. Uh, ongoing, uh, quite vicious, uh, childish and destructive in my view, uh, but I think that it's worth our analyzing together. Then I will comment on some of the unknowns, unknown factors going forward in US-China relations, uh, and in particular on possible impact of the American presidential election. But then lastly, I'd like to talk about the United States-China relationship in its proper context, which is a global context and what US-China competition and the management of the relationship is likely to mean for other countries and regions, but then most importantly, what other countries and regions can do to shape the management of US-China relations. This to me is, is, is the real theme. And so I'd like to end on that. So firstly, uh, the current situation in US-China relations, I don't think that anybody would argue uh, with my description of this as a crisis uh, and as a crisis with worldwide implications. The United States and China have embarked on a comprehensive worldwide competition. Comprehensive meaning uh, that it involves every aspect of state to state and international relations. The United States and China each wants to be the nation with the most influence on not necessarily dominance of, not necessarily a decisive influence, but the most influence on uh, security architectures worldwide, trade, financial, and investment regimes. Very importantly, they want to lead in the development, marketization, and regulation of new technologies. And this may be the most important aspect of their competition going forward but they're also competing to shape international practices, laws, and norms. And then inevitably, as part of that effort to shape global governance, such as it is, there's also an ideological competition. We are competing to shape the value systems that inform global norms and global practices. So it's a comprehensive competition and it's happening all over the world in Latin America, Central America, the Caribbean, in Africa, Central Asia, Europe, throughout the world, also in cyberspace and in outer space. And again, this is, this is new. 
new spheres for global competition, new technologies, new means. Now, that was already, I think, underway, that competition, for reasons that are structural and historic. Before the advent of Xi Jinping and Donald Trump. So much of this competition uh, was bound to occur regardless of leadership. Then, in my view, both nations have been extremely poorly led in this competition. While it is not primarily the fault of either nation, both nations have exacerbated the problem through issues of leadership. We saw in 2017 in President Trump's national security strategy, the very clear statement that China and Russia, but China primarily, are now America's greatest geostrategic challenge. And in fact, the claim that, that China constitutes the greatest threat to the United States, a greater threat than terrorism. This was a, a fairly direct, typically Trumpian, uh, rather American direct declaration. China doesn't make declarations of that sort. It's diplomatic language is far more traditional. It's couched in analogies and vague, polite phrases. But in fact, the leadership of China realized a number of years ago that the United States was the greatest challenge to China achieving what it sees as its righteous goals. So there's a sense in which while America has been uh, particularly brutal, I would argue vulgar and direct in its language, that's true, but still, we're catching up with China. China actually realized the na this nature of the relationship earlier, but it doesn't. its diplomacy isn't as declarative. So you all know that after this national security strategy declared China uh, the greatest challenge to the United States, we then had a trade war. The technology competition with particular focus on Huawei and new and emerging technologies, especially artificial intelligence and 5G. We then had, again, against this background already of deep distrust, the issue of China's treatment of the Uyghurs uh, in Xinjiang, where up to a million have been basically placed in detention camps. And that, in, and that issue has re-emphasized human rights concerns, concerns about the nature of the Chinese regime. This was all underway before the pandemic hit, before COVID. And I hope that this, I see some of you are wearing masks. I know I think you have over 21,000 deaths already in Peru and, and, and climbing. Uh, so I hope that you and your institutions are all safe. This is ongoing. But the pandemic uh, has also exacerbated US-China. I think hostilities is not too strong a word. Uh, now, this not, need not have been the case. The pandemic need not have accelerated distrust, but it has. On top of that, we have then seen tit for tat expulsions of journalists and now closing of consulates. We have economic recessions in both countries and around the world. And we have seen growing American domestic chaos uh, because of the killing and murder of George Floyd and the Black Lives Nicole, Matter movement, all Nicole, of which exacerbates Nicole. a lot of these concerns. And then as you know, in the past few weeks, there has been a cataract, a flood of pressure on China and actions by China that have exacerbated this. We have seen China's imposing a new national security law on Hong Kong. We have seen the Chinese-Indian border dispute uh, turn violent, uh, rather gruesomely so, with over 40 Indian soldiers killed with clubs with nails through them. We don't know what the Chinese casualties were in that. We have seen questions about TikTok and the Chinese WeChat app. We've seen China increasing pressure on Taiwan and in the South China Sea. So this keeps building, uh, it's almost an absurd level of pressure on the relationship. I am spending a great deal of my time uh, with journalists and policymakers who are asking in the United States, how do we understand, how do we frame this barrage of activity? And I'll come back to that in a minute. And then of course we have the 2020 presidential election, increasing uncertainty. So where does that leave us now? We see the partial disintegration or decoupling in areas of trade, financial systems, technological systems, civil society. 
And then most importantly, and I don't say this because I'm speaking to a, a university group, I actually think that this is the most worrisome development. Yes, we have seen some trade decoupling, some financial and technological decoupling. But the biggest concern is that we now see the decoupling, alienation between the United States and China in our knowledge and information systems. And by knowledge, I mean universities and expert contacts. And by information systems, I'm referring not only to traditional media, but social media as well. Our universities have been very closely integrated to our mutual benefit. But that is coming apart as Chinese universities under Xi Jinping become far more politicized and as American suspicions that Chinese scholars are using the openness of American universities to build Chinese capability at America's expense and to steal intellectual property, as these concerns grow, our knowledge systems are coming apart, our information systems are coming apart such that Americans and Chinese, when we speak to each other, and I'm in a number of dialogues with you know, friends in China, we increasingly refer to different narratives. We invoke different facts. We appeal to different authorities to validate our facts and it makes conversation very difficult. So all of this decoupling then leads to this big question now of is this a new Cold War? Is this a new Cold War? This question has been, it first came to the fore about two years ago, a little longer. And most Americans in the expert community, the international affairs community or the academic community have been very opposed to this historical analogy, have been warning that this, we should not use the phrase Cold War because it makes Americans think about America's Cold War with the Soviet Union. And that is a misleading historical analogy, uh, primarily for two reasons. One is that the Soviet Union was never a peer competitor of the United States. It was a nuclear power and a military power that was able to use its military power to become a political rival, but it was never an economic rival of the United States. And it wasn't really a soft power or ideological rival either. Uh, China is. China is a true peer competitor in every sphere that still lags behind the United States by some measures of power, but has drawn even in others and either is or will be ahead of the United States in other indices of power. So this is a very different kind of challenge than the Soviet Union was. Also in, uh, in during this, the Cold War, the United States and the Soviet Union largely existed in different spheres. They weren't integrated, but the United States and China are integrated with each other and with the entire world. And so for these two reasons, experts have been saying, please don't call this a new Cold War. There's also now the new issue that the United States and China must cooperate if the world is to solve some intractable problems like global warming and public health issues. So experts have been saying this is not a new Cold War. Well, bad news for the experts, bad news for the academics. We don't get to decide what political leaders and our populations and media call something like US-China relations. The phrase new Cold War seems to be catching on despite what the experts say. Again, we don't get to decide. We may think that we're right. We may have a more nuanced explanation, but we don't decide what phrases catch on. And so it is now beginning to seem like more like a Cold War. And most worrisomely, and this is where I, I tend to think that we probably do end up calling this a new Cold War. US-China competition also involves an arms race and the resurrection of the doctrine of mutual assured destruction. And the new arms race, in my view, unnecessary, unaffordable, and immoral, but it is still happening. The new arms race is not only nuclear. It also involves cyber warfare, cyber weapons, and the weaponization of outer space which are two factors that we do not understand the implications of the, or the costs of. So now when we look back at US-China relations, we can see that from 1978, 79, when we formed relations with China to about 2013, the coming of Xi Jinping, the United States and China and most of the rest of the world, we had a common narrative about China's rise. And it was a positive narrative. It was about the success 
of Chinese development. The common narrative about China was a narrative about improving the welfare of one fifth of humankind. A fantastic achievement and a, an achievement that we can all take pr pride in. That common narrative is now gone. We now have separate narratives. And the narrative in the United States and in other countries is that we now see how the Chinese Communist Party wants to use its power. And we see that it is a fundamentally bad actor. Fundamentally bad actor. That's the new narrative in the United States. There is a sense in the United States, but also in much of Europe and Asia, that the goal of Chinese foreign policy is to leverage its wealth to build its power. The basic formula of Chinese foreign policy in this view is that China seeks to win deference through dependence. Deference through dependence. And so the Washington view is that China's foreign policy seeks, and this actually is not surprising, this is how any big power would act. It seeks to make the world more friendly and more welcoming to a Chinese Communist Party that is increasingly repressive at home, and that's, I think, undeniably true, and aggressive internationally. The sense in Washington, in Europe, in Australia, in Japan, in South Korea, is that if the goal from Beijing is to legitimize internationally the illiberal practices of the Communist Party, if that's the goal, then we just can't work with these guys. From 1979 until 2013, we had increasing interoperability with China. Now there's a sense that we can't work with these guys and that interoperability is diminishing. Okay, the blame game, the blame game. And I know that uh, in Peru, uh, you hear a lot of this. You hear um, mostly in closed conferences or closed meetings uh, from, you tend to feel pressured and bullied by both the United States and China, pushing you to make them, you know, to, to choose a side or to make declarations that you don't want to make because it's not in your interest. And both big countries are blaming the other. China says, you know, look at the trade war, look at all these provocations uh, from, from the United States. They started it. And America says, Look at what China is and what China wants. They started it. Who's right? Well, the answer, of course, is that, that, that they're both right from their own points of view. I think what you see, if you look at the different aspects of competition between the United States and China, is a consistent dynamic in which you have uh, longstanding issues with China, longstanding chronic problems with China, and then you see acute responses, specific recent responses from the United States. So we see the chronic and the acute. So if we look at the trade war, it's certainly true that the trade war is launched when Donald Trump imposes tariffs on China and pursues it. And so in that sense, yes, America started the trade war. However, America's complaints about the lack of openness in the Chinese economy its lack of reciprocity, China's treatment of intellectual property, and its state subsidies of national champions. Those are long-standing complaints from the United States and other countries that China has known about and done nothing about for decades. And this is why Trump's White House says, no, we didn't start it. It's just that we have been finally had a delayed reaction to China. And that's also true in the area of tech. You know, we now see America wanting to ban ZTE and ban Huawei uh, and now ban WeChat. And so because America has been very aggressive, it looks like America started it. But of course, American telecoms have never been welcome in China. There's, the, there's again, the acute and the chronic. You know, would China permit a foreign power to build out its 5G network? No way in Hell, China identified these as strategic industries from the beginning, and others have always been locked out. So again, longstanding Chinese situations or issues and an acute American question. It's the same with social media. 
with TikTok and now WeChat being banned. And China says, see, the Americans have a Cold War mentality. But of course, Facebook and Twitter have always been banned in China, as is Google. So from the American point of view, we are playing catch up here. Uh, it's the same we're seeing financial decoupling. We are seeing pressure to delist from American stock exchanges, Chinese companies that don't make their own audits available to the Securities and Exchange Commission. I actually think this is reasonable. I think that if you're gonna list on American exchanges, you should have to accord with what they're doing. And China is saying, see Cold War mentality. Question, can American companies list on Chinese exchanges? No, right? So again, it's, it's, it's the long-term and the acute. Um, and this comes up with issues like the Confucius Institutes where uh, there have been over 200 in the United States. Some of them are closing down, but China has never allowed the American government to open up something like the equivalent of Confucius Institutes on Chinese campuses. So you get the point. In all of these cases, I think what you see is chronic conditions in China, which China has been hearing about for decades and done nothing about. And then the acute responses from the United States, some of which are reasonable, some of which aren't. And these, the chronic and the acute are exacerbating each other. So if we think about the US-China relationship like a patient in a medical ward, in general, if a patient has severe chronic conditions and se severe acute conditions, and they're making each other worse, this patient is not healthy. This patient is probably toward approaching the end of life, right? That's, that's, that's the sign of when things aren't going well. So what are the possibilities then for this patient for US-China relations? Well, one is, is death. Death would be a real new Cold War, complete with, as I've said, deep distrust, mutual alienation, decoupling, and mutual assured destruction. The patient can recover. There can be a resurrection or a rebirth. This would be a re-embrace of engagement between the United States and China based on a recognition that our interests, our mutual interests outweigh our disagreements. That I think is unlikely. There's a third possibility between death and rebirth. And that is something that is not quite death, a kind of zombie relationship. And that's where I think we are right now. We're in a state where you know, the United States and China in the midst of a zombie relationship. Okay, let's go now to topic number three which is, as I said, this recent avalanche of Trump administration actions concerned about, you know, about China. Every week, there are a few new announcements, some of which are not as dramatic as they sound. But the mere drumbeat, this sort of continual, almost sort of machine gun of anti-China actions itself has implications for the relationship, even if some of these announcements don't really have very many teeth. And this pace of um, sort of hard on China announcements is unprecedented in its scope. It is, I think, dizzying for all of us. It's reckless and it's deliberate. So the question is, why is it deliberate? And I, I, I think there are uh, five different motives at work here, three of which are cynical, but two of which are essentially sincere. Um, so the first, obviously, and I think this is understood, is that the White House is trying to distract Americans, American voters, from the Trump administration's failed response to the pandemic and the Black Lives Matter demonstrations. And it's trying to distract Americans by blaming the Chinese Communist Party for spreading the coronavirus and for spreading authoritarianism internationally. And that's essentially a cynical political move. Uh, secondly, the, and that campaign supports the second goal, which is also political and also somewhat cynical, although typical, which is that President Trump is trying to win re-election by painting himself as tough on China and Joe Biden as weak. So a willingness to really damage this relationship between the superpowers to get Trump re-elected. And then the last cynical motive is a typical Trump motive, which is that you know, Trump is pushing these tactics with a real ferocity because of his, his overall political stratagem, 
which is that he seems to believe that generating constant chaos and fear will maximize his scope for action and improve his re-election chances. Now, there may be a fourth cynical motive at work here, and this is something that a lot of American uh, China policy experts have been speculating about. Uh, there is broad speculation that the hardliners around President Trump, like Mike Pompeo, like Peter Navarro, uh, like Matthew Pottinger, that they think Trump probably won't win re-election. Therefore, they're trying to hit China as hard as they can now in order to lock in hostile relations between the United States and China, even if Trump loses. In other words, if you go, go as far as you can now so that you've made cer taken certain steps vis-a-vis -vis China, which President Biden couldn't walk back. That's an interpretation, um, but I have no inside information as to whether or not that is true. But Trump's China policy is not entirely cynical. China is claiming that all of these actions are only about Trump wanting to win re-election, and they're only about an America which is in decline, trying desperately and hopelessly to cling to its hegemony. Now, that's a very convenient interpretation for China because it absolves China of any responsibility for the state of relations. Um, but it isn't true, actually. China has a lot of responsibility for the state of relations, as does the United States. I would say that the White House is also, and many Americans are also, cynicism in politics, putting that aside. There is genuine concern that a wealthy, aggrieved, meaning angry and wanting revenge, and ambitious China really is a threat to American standards and to global interests. That is also sincere. Global standards and interests are under threat from a more illiberal China. So the administration means what it says about China. They mean it, even if they're also behaving as they do for domestic political reasons. And then finally, uh, I think the administration, this also is, is sincere, not really cynical. The administration, and Secretary of State Pompeo has said this, is pushing China as hard as it is because it thinks this is working. It sees this tactic working. A growing list of countries and the American people themselves have gone from viewing China as a developmental success story, this old narrative, to seeing the Chinese Communist Party as a bad actor uh, that has to be countered. Uh, and we just saw this week, uh, Chile deciding to go with a, a Japanese bid instead of a Chinese bid for a, a, a trans-Pacific uh, uh, underwater cable linking Latin America to Asia. Now they're going to go through uh, New Zealand and, and linking to Australia to a Japanese link, which is the Japanese bid, rather than taking the Chinese bid to go directly to Shanghai. So you know, the, the, from the Trump administration's point of view, these pressure tactics work, and Trump is keeping up this attack. He just said yesterday, if Biden wins, we're all going to have to learn Chinese. Let me just say, we should all be studying Chinese anyway. <laughs> you know, it's uh, regardless of who wins. So this is, you know, this is a, a sort of a nonsensical view. Um, I think my view is that uh, Spanish and Chinese and Arabic uh, should all be offered in every American public school every day, beginning in the first grade. Uh, so more Americans, more Peruvians learning Chinese. This is a very good thing in our own national interest. Okay, now the unknowns going forward. Well, obviously we don't know how the pandemic plays out yet. Um, and we also don't know about the knock-on effects of the pandemic. Recessions, domestic and global recessions. We just saw today that the UK's uh, GDP dropped 20% in the second quarter, 20%. America's dropped 9.5%. Those are going forward, but we're going to see then the knock-on, the secondary effects, uh, like regional recessions leading to malnutrition and new massive migrations that are extremely destabilizing internationally and domestically. There's also an unknown question about the United States and China, both of which face tremendous domestic challenges. How much capacity do the superpowers actually have to pursue competition? 
What's their real capacity to do that? This could be a limiting factor. Obviously, who wins the 2020 American presidential election will make a big difference. But I think that the important thing for the rest of the world to understand is that even under President Biden, the nature of US-China relations as fundamentally contentious, this won't change. I think that if Biden is elected, you will see a pause from the United States uh, to recalibrate its approach to competition. And that pause may be cause for over-optimism. I think it will just be a pause. I do think that under President, uh, President Biden, if we have a President Biden, by no means certain, um, there will be fewer factors of instability. President Biden will not have the same kind of incendiary insulting rhetoric. President Biden will re-enable the expert bureaucracy in the United States. And expert bureaucracies, when they're enabled, tend to uh, mitigate against extreme swings in policy. President Biden will also reach out to allies, which, which would also tend to stabilize the relationship, uh, and I think would have a more strategic approach. Then on the Chinese side, there's a question about whether Xi Jinping and China can actually re-embrace and get back on the road to genuine reform, which Xi Jinping has rejected. And then the last, and this will lead to the last section, I'll read it briefly. The last unknown and potentially the most important, and this is where you know, Latin America and Peru come into play. What decisions do third countries make? about US-China relations. One of the biggest mistakes you can make in speaking about the US and China is to speak as if they're the only two countries in the world. And when you speak that way, it's, it's really hard to avoid the conclusion that they're headed for conflict. But they're not the only two countries in the world. Um, other countries have agency, other countries have an impact. And I think that it's key that other countries use their agency. A great many other nations, and I've spent a lot of time with Europeans and uh, Asian nations on this. I've spent less time uh, with, the, with Latin American nations, which is one of the reasons I'm so glad to begin this dialogue. Many nations are waiting passively and quietly as observers to see what US-China relations are gonna do to, to them, hoping that they'll be able to navigate and hedge play the other, the two powers off each other to defend their interests. Here's, here's the thing. You are not, other countries are not spectators to US-China competition. You are the field on which this competition is going to be played out. There's no avoiding this. Passivity is not going to work in my view. I just published a, an essay, which of course will be ignored. Um, saying that mismanagement of US-China relations, and I mean this seriously, mismanagement of this relationship, think about mutual assured destruction and a technological and a financial and a trade war and add to that a nuclear cyberspace and outer space arms race. Mismanagement of US-China relations is now the greatest medium and short-term threat to global peace the mismanagement of this relationship. Global warming is probably a bigger but long-term threat. A short and medium, the biggest short and medium-term threat to global peace and prosperity is the mismanagement of this relationship. If that's right, if you agree with that, then the mismanagement of US-China relations should be the subject of a day-long session at the UN General Assembly meeting in September. This is what the UN is for. It is time for every country to come out and say publicly to their own people, to the United States and China, what you've been whispering under Chatham House rules and in back rooms about your worries about China and the United States. I know that you worry about both, feel bullied by both, are concerned about mismanagement by both. It is time to make that not a whispered back room concern, but topic number one, at the UN. And doing so will help change the global narrative and help you to protect 
your own interests. And the global narrative needs to be, this is not anti-China, this is not anti-US. This is anti-mismanagement of the bilateral relationship. And then the right narrative in my view is that mismanagement of US-China relations is a global threat on equal footing with global warming and pandemics. That is the global narrative that needs to be socialized broadly, not just in expert communities, but around the world. So use the UN, believe in your own agency and exercise it rather than waiting as passive spectators, hoping you don't get trampled. Neither the United States nor China is all that powerful. They're both constrained. Longer term, um, I, you know, the, the contest between the United States and China is in many ways a competition between models of capitalism and between different visions, and I'm gonna get philosophical on you here, of the meaning of being human, different visions of the good. That's really what you're being asked to consider. The Chinese model of the good is that human beings are homo economicus. We are economic beings whose desires are limited to the largely economic realm. The Chinese model is um, that if basic and economic technological material needs are met, we're done, everything is set. Uh, and that model has a great deal of appeal, uh, especially to developing nations. You know, if we think about, um, just to analogize to international relations, um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know, the five levels of needs, and the first is simply physiological. Uh, and China puts a great deal of emphasis here. Whenever you wanna to speak to China about human rights, political and social rights, voting, freedom of speech, freedom of association, China's response is, well, of course, freedom from hunger is a much more basic human right, right? They, they go immediately to the physiological. And of course that's true, but feeding your people is not the measure of a good modern government. It's the absolute bare minimum you expect from any government, modern or not. Um, and then you go from the physiological needs to security needs. And China's also very big about talking about security, stability, safety. Now there's a question here for each society about how you want to understand your security and stability needs. Do you wish, as Ecuador has done, you know, to have a security camera on every single corner linked with facial recognition technology that can also look at your credit card and your social media? And I, th I think you've all solved this. This is a really hard question. Uh, Washington speaks as though, oh, you know, China's, China's security system, um, the, this is techno totalitarianism. And of course it is techno totalitarianism. It's very, very worrisome. It sounds like George Orwell's 1984. On the other hand, I have to admit that if my 12 year old daughter was kidnapped at the bus stop, I would sure as hell wish that there were a security camera there with facial recognition technology and artificial intelligence, right? I mean, this is, so in China, when it talks about security, how do you get people to value security over freedom? And the answer is, this is also Trump's answer, is that you stoke their fears. You stoke their fears. The odds of my daughter being kidnapped at the bus stop are actually extremely low, right? So you go, you know, physiology, security, that's where, you know, China's very good at homo economicus. We will provide better education outcomes. We will provide better health outcomes. We will provide transportation, modern technology, a good standard of living. All these things are extremely important. And China's been tremendously successful with them. Then, you know, Maslow, his third and fourth level of needs have to do with needs for belonging, you know, need for love. These are largely culturally construed. But where China, I think, and this is what other countries have to, to really wonder about. When you get to um, self-actualization, people's desire for agency, for freedom, for expression, to participate, to have their voices heard in societies and politics, uh, this is where China, I think, uh, falls rather flat on its face. And this is something that other nations have to keep track of in, in I think, in, in working 
with China. China likes to say that it doesn't export ideology. And it's true in the first instance that China doesn't say, we'll only work with you if you're, if you're a communist country. It's true, China, China doesn't do that. China never makes a direct request. That's true. Um, however, it turns out, and there are many examples of this, that if China sees you as benefiting from its wealth, through trade, through investment, through Belt and Road kinds of initiatives, uh, it turns out there is a condition there, which is that you're not allowed to criticize China. China doesn't broach any criticism. And this, this is where we get to building deference through dependence. This is where we get to legitimizing China's practices. If China sees you as beneficiary from China, you don't get to criticize China. Well, what does that mean? It means that if you have a free press, you have to silence it. And if you have a vibrant civil society, you have to squelch it. And doing that really amounts to an indirect, in my view, export of ideology. This is where it gets very tricky. I happen to know, for example, that there have been pressures um, in Peru uh, on Confucius Institutes, universities that have them. This has happened in the United States. You know, don't hold public lectures on Liu Xiaobo or, the, or, or Taiwan or the national security law or Uyghurs. There's very real pressure for silence. This is, and this has happened in the United States. American university presidents have been threatened in their offices by Chinese diplomats. And I know that it's happened uh, in Peru as well. If you don't believe this, if you think I'm exaggerating this kind of pressure, look at the experience of Sweden, of Norway, of Canada, of Australia, of the Maldives, of, of Nauru, you know, big, you know, bigger and smaller countries uh, that have come into extraordinary pressure. Look at, for example, um, the experience of Ecuador, which has uh, drawn very closely to China, and this Chinese fishing fleet that is now surrounding the Galapagos, uh, ignoring Ecuadorian representations and just mining you know, all sorts of endangered and vital species uh, around the Galapagos. So what do we do with that? Now, just two minutes, if, yeah. you, if you bear with me the end of that. I guess my, my prescription would yeah. be only okay. this. Ya, ya lo abrí. Ah, espérate un segundo. Pero, mira, hay un cuadrito que dice Hugo Palma, pero... pero por favor, no, apáguense el micrófono. Apáguense el micrófono, por favor. So sorry. <laughs> right to rush. So I would just, last sorry. thing, my, my, my advice to every nation dealing with this, okay. in addition to exercising your own agency, is, is simply this. Because you've dealt with the United States for a very long time, and you've seen benefits of that, and you've also seen harm come from that. You've seen hypocrisy, you've seen dishonesty, you've seen exploitation, you've seen benefits. You're, I know that you're extremely aware of, of the difficulty of working with the United States. My key piece of advice is, is only this, be as skeptical of China and China's claims as you are of the United States and the United States claims. That does not mean having to choose between them. I understand, and many people in Washington understand that that is not in your interests. But be as skeptical of Chinese claims as you are of the United States claims, and don't let yourself be coerced by either power. I think that that would actually be helpful to both the United States and Beijing. Thank you. Thanks, Professor Robert Daly. You have given us a very comprehensive picture of the whole China-United States relationship. We have, you have told many, many things. But one of the questions, yeah, that uh, I am very interested in, and you mentioned, is that this confrontation is not new. Yeah, you mentioned that in the December 2007, especially when the United States published this national strategy document, he mentioned uh, that China and Russia are strategic uh, rivals. Really. So that's why from that document, we could see that the escalation was going to increase. But of course, you saw also that the pandemics and the election year also is making this confrontation more acute. And I guess before giving the floor to our commentators, I am very worried about one of the things that you said, that you said that countries, uh, they will not just be witness to the competition, 
they will have to take sides <laughs> if China United States confrontation is going they'll, to. They'll be asked to take sides. <laughs> they they no. may not have to. Uh, yeah, they will ask us to take sides. Yeah, that's the question. Really. They will pressure us to take sides. So that's yeah. a very worrisome aspect. Okay, so let's uh, give the floor to our two commenters. So first, we will have uh, Ms. Maria Osterlock. Please, Maria Osterlock, can you give out your comment or question for Professor Robert Dillon? Yes, um, thank you uh, very much for your conference. I think uh, it has been very rich in seeing the problem from various aspects no, of the relationship. So I will make just a um, uh, brief comment. Uh, and uh, well, I would say that it is interesting to see that compared to 10 years ago, uh, how, how China's foreign policy has become more assertive, more active, and uh, I, as you, you said, China is more confident now. And the reasons maybe from the economic perspective is that obviously its economy in general, general terms is better than other countries, especially regarding with this uh, pandemic situation. Uh, well, as you may know, China's GDP will grow between 1.5% to 2% this year compared to the rest of the world. And uh, I think it will be the economy that will grow more this year. Second, China, I think, uh, well, has control rapidly, with less harm the pandemic issue. So I think China may be taking advantage of this strength position, as they may think they are they are doing a better job. They are making a better job. Mm -hmm. And of course, China has a very strong leader. Uh, President Xi, who has a very clear and ambitious goal for its country, you know, the Chinese dream. First, becoming moderately well off society by 2021, a modern soci soci socialist sorry, country by 2035, and be a developed nation by about 2049, right? And then we have the Belt and Road Initiative, the main in China 2025. So uh, President Xi has consolidated his power more than any other leader. He is considered uh, the stronger leader after Mao, and some say mm -hmm. that even he competes with, Ma with Mao, right? So, well. So, I think China feels, believe that it's a strong nation, and that's why we see decisions taken, as you said, uh, for example, in India uh, or Hong Kong, and many wonder if these are not counterproductive measures. Mm, but, well, anyways, uh, also, uh, I think that is why China is not going to step back, it's going to reciprocate and respond to the actions taken by US against the country. And uh, I think China is probably waiting a change of government in the US and mm -hmm. maybe also waiting that Biden wins the elections as, they, as it would be better to sit with him and do negotiations as in rhetoric terms, he seems more moderate and uh, as you said, and uh, well, I think it is worrying that what will happen to the rest of the country since both US and China are the most important ones, the most important countries in the world in economic terms, especially. Uh, well, it has been seen that these conflicts, as you said, is affecting other countries in, for example, in terms of 5G technology, um, adoption. No? And uh, as a Latin American, uh, I am concerned that the presence of the United States is decreasing here. And I believe that the countries should have a balanced relationship. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that the United States is a very important partner, a very large economy, of course. But in recent, recent years, uh, there has been a lesser presence, no? as I said, in the region, as it seems to be more occupied, I think, in other issues. And uh, we are seeing, obviously, a greater presence of China in Latin America. And that is not a bad thing, of course. But I do believe that we should have a more balanced relationship with the uh, important countries, with the great powers. I think that is my comment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Maria. Uh, and then we will give the, the floor to uh, Gabriela Mancia. But just before that, I want to welcome, uh, there are very important personalities attending our Seminar, uh, we will come Cecilia Galarreta, Ambassador Cecilia Galarreta. She's the uh, section, the chief of the Asia section of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Peru. Also, we have Ambassador Hugo Palma, Ambassador Jorge 
Abarca, Ambassador Liliana Treyes. Also, we have uh, uh, diplomats from other foreign embassy, uh, Mrs. Brandon Hotogon from the Australian Embassy, Mr. King from the Embassy of Korea, also Dr. Armando Yarleke from San Marcos National University. As you see, Professor Deli, there is a lot of personalities very attentive to your discourse. Please, uh, Gabriela Mancia, you have the floor. Uh, uh, yes, a minute. Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, can, do you, do you, I guess you're on mute, you're on mute. The microphone is off, I think. Ah, the microphone, please, Gabriela, can you open your microphone? Okay, now can, can you? Okay, no, now? please, please, yes. Okay, yeah, actually, yeah, thank you very much. I, I just, uh, thank you for this wonderful presentation. Um, now I'm located in Taipei, I'm doing a research, and actually, Yes, uh, some days ago, I, I mean, uh, uh, yes, one day ago, the U.S. Secretary of Health and Human Service, right. Alex Azar, uh, paid a visit to Taiwan and met with his leader, Tsai Ing-wen. No? Uh, the meeting uh, uh, was, of course, uh, 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 that uh, occurred some reaction uh, from, uh, from uh, and enforced this kind of a, a problem between China and uh, and the U.S. No, I I want to mention. Yeah, it was uh, really interesting uh, that uh, now the relation between China and the U.S. is is in the lowest point in the in the last four decades. No, actually there are many things related that, that the U.S. did in the past with with Russia and and uh, uh, according to, for example, closed uh, the consulate. And now, uh, of course, that also with China, no? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, 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 I think U.S. and China, each of the countries, the limiting its territory of influence, no? As, 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 as uh, Professor Daly said, I think there is some kind of of pressure, but the countries need to understand their own interest. Yes, in order to fulfill the the uh, uh, to, I mean, to have some kind of agreement with some, uh, 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 or do some kind of uh, groups with other countries. Yes, in order to fulfill and to persecute their own interest. No, uh, th that's I think it's 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 uh, very uh, very important. No? As Maria said, actually. Yes, uh, uh, I mean, the ascension of the President Xi Jinping uh, as a, uh, is trying to develop the Chinese dream, no? And it's started to communicate. But as, as uh, the expositor Dali said, yeah, actually, uh, China has his own interest during, uh, during, during many years ago, no? They act as a... Uh, uh, Five years, they have a very long run interest. So uh, I, I'm now experienced, for example, to study in, in Taipei, you know? And this kind of, of uh, is, it's very interesting to to share class with Chinese people, you no? Know? In, mm. in the, yes, at the first day of the class, they want to be the first, you no? Know? They, they, they want to compete and they, uh, if they, they think to compete with somebody, they choose the American and they want to be the first, you no? Know? It's, it's like, it's like some kind of interest of competition, you no? Know? Only in the classroom. So I can see that uh, this kind of competition was f for uh, was in in China many years ago. No, therefore they they did so many plans, and now it's just the consequence of what Ch China did in the past. And now is uh, uh, with Xi Jinping, uh, yes, uh, uh, the political uh, step. No, uh, so uh, and uh, actually I agree with with. with with the uh, professor Dale that that uh, yeah maybe the U.S. didn't didn't uh, prepare too much didn't didn't show this at first. Mm. Well, uh, well, I, I I don't want to be extended in this, but uh, uh, I think these these are my comments. Thank you.
Thank you. Thanks, Gabriela. Uh, Professor, I don't know if you want to comment on the comments or we open the floor to some question, perhaps. Well, then both of the commentators, thank you. you. You've touched on a great many issues. Uh, why don't we, maybe we should just go to as many uh, other comments as we can to uh, really make this a discussion. And that would include, I think, you know, asking questions, not only of me, but of the commentators. I think, you know, the more this is really a discussion, it shouldn't just be question, answer, question, answer. There's a tremendous amount of expertise in the room, uh, not only from Peru, but from other countries as well. So I would, I would really welcome Mm -hmm. uh, an exchange between all of the participants. Perfect, we are going to do that. Before that, also, we want to welcome Mr. Juan Carlos Valdivia. He was the officers of the Commercial Trade Agency of Peru in, in Indonesia, and also he working for the Asian, Peru representative in the Asian group. Okay, uh, we open the floor to the question. If anybody wants to make a question, just uh, unmute the microphone and, and you can ask directly to Professor Robert. Well, hello, uh, good morning, uh, I'm Professor sorry, Cecilia, I, uh, I, I'm sorry, I, I didn't, you know, sign that I wanted to speak, but I really want to thank you for your very interesting, you know, uh, speech. I, I have to admit, I'm, I'm new to Asia, you know, <laughs> I've mostly, in my career, I've been working with the US and Western Hemisphere. Uh, I was actually the director for North America before becoming director general for Asia. So I, I really find your you know, perspective very interesting. And um, I wanted to ask you, as I'm sort of learning, uh, you know, the Chinese, I, I agree totally with you that, I mean, that's for the few sort of weeks I am um, in, in the position, in this position, I've, I've seen what you said that um, even though China says, that they do not want to impose their model. Uh, they do expect no criticism about what they do or their choices. Uh, and as you will say, also, we you know, do not necessarily agree with some of the positions, especially, of course, on the human rights. Um, yeah. um, so it is, as you said, a bit tricky. How to you know, navigate both with the US and China at this time, where both countries are really sort of trying to press all their allies, you know, and, and bring them to their side. Um, sure. And, did you, did you uh, have more? My, yes, I, I wanted to ask you about how important it is, you know, in understanding the Chinese view uh, that cultural, you know, uh, uh, sort of heritage, you know, that the, uh, you, you've mentioned very clearly that the perception about human beings and the needs that we have are very different. And I would very much appreciate if you could, you know, uh, further develop a bit, you know, these, because uh, I think it's, it's really important for us when we will, um, you know, have to take a position on, on some, you know, topics. Uh, and I agree with you that it's probably time. I've already spoken with, you know, New Zealand and Australia, and you know, especially for the Southeast Asia and, and the issues involved there with Hong Kong and, and the Maritime Sea. And, and you, 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 you said, you, what you said is really right. They do feel concerned and they do feel the pressure of both of them. And what I saw also just, just to finish uh, my intervention is that, for instance, uh, late, uh, uh, you know, uh, was this week? No, it was last week, you know, when uh, the Asian, you know, uh, the Southeast Asian um, Association of Nations, you know, uh, had their 53rd anniversary. And in their speeches, both the Vietnamese, uh, you know, uh, my, my Minister of Foreign Affairs and the, you know, the Secretary General of Asia, they, especially the Vietnamese, I think, and Asian 
as well, representative, they both stress that they are not going to let, you know, the US and China, you know, uh, get them involved in their disputes. And I think that was very important. It was very clear. It was a, a public statement. In that sense, I think your advice on, on going, you know, on the stating about these publicly in the next, you know, UN um, meetings uh, is, is going to be really, really important as well. We, we will probably talk about this uh, internally. But I just wanted to thank you very much. It's been very, very in interesting listening to you. Thank you. I mean, I guess, you know, my, I would say don't talk about it internally, make it external. You know, you ask how you can navigate and clearly a part of this is you know, safety in numbers. If you, if all nations express their concerns to both countries, it inoculates you against specific acts of revenge from either. If there is a broadly socialized narrative and I, I really mean broadly, not just among diplomats, but you know, say most most people in most countries now know that you know pandemics and global warming are huge global threats. Add the mismanagement of U.S.-China relations to that list publicly, and when you do that, the next time America or China comes knocking at your door and is pressuring you behind closed doors to take sides and take actions that are not in your interest. That narrative is already in the room as a rebuttal and a defense. It may sound soft, but this is, this is, this is powerful stuff. It, it, it exposes the devices and the mechanics of, of both countries. So make it public and constant, again, not internal. You know, I would, it's interesting, you know, China has this um, CELAC mechanism with the countries of Latin America and the Caribbean where they bring everybody to Beijing and they sort of have, they want it to be a love fest and they want it to be about homo economicus and investment. What happens, what do you think happens if you raise these concerns at CELAC? What do you think happens if you raise say the Uyghur situation? Tell you what happens, you're going to get bull whipped. You're going to get a really nasty lecture about how inappropriate this is and how this is China's internal affair. Um, and the Americans can be rhetorically very nasty, but not, I, I, I think there's more political, you know, there's a tradition of political pluralism in the United States. And this is why I say make it, make it public uh, and don't allow yourself to be coerced. Don't allow your standards to be lowered, you know, by either country. If we, in fact, um, you know, Professor Osterloh uh, mentioned this as well. You know, if, if we end up with spheres of influence, I think this is extremely harmful and, it, and it, it leads toward conflict. I think what we really need is other nations to be far more, to be equally skeptical of both countries and equally defensive of their needs. What you really want and what America should want, if you take, you know, if Peru or India or Brazil, or Saudi Arabia, whatever country it is, what we should really want if we are wise is for all of these third countries to have good relations, uncoerced good relations with both China and the United States. If third countries don't let themselves be coerced and if you, Peru, have good relations with China on your terms and good relations with the United States also on your terms, what does that do? That necessarily involves the United States and China in complex networks of compromise. And it's those complex networks of compromise, in my view, and I, I realize this sounds quixotic and too idealistic, but it's those complex networks of compromise that are actually our best guarantor of peace not siding with one country or the other. Um, and so I, I think that making it public, believing in agency and stopping, stop being passive. You also asked this question about culture. You know, there's a problem with culture in international relations or in our interpersonal relations, which is either of us can invoke it, right? You can say that my argument is insensitive to your culture and I can't say anything about that. I can say the same thing. It's simply a dead end. 
So we need to keep it at the level of interests. Um, and so don't, don't let yourself, you know, China loves to say, well, we have 5,000 years of continuous culture and they sort of invoke that as a bulldozer, which means you must do things their way. Why? You know, Peru, Latin America has culture, the West has culture. It, it, it's, it's a bogus claim. It's not, and I say this as somebody who's done a lot of cultural diplomacy. Um, don't let yourself be put up, be frightened or intimidated by that. You know, insist, if, if they wanna come and deal in Peru and build a highway or an airport in Peru, what culture matters? The culture, and more importantly, the laws and standards of Peru. And if China or the United States doesn't want to accord with the laws and standards of Peru, then show them the door. I, I've, I've been amazed. The same thing you know, with Canada, they seem even, they seem not to believe in their own agency. You know, China, China is, is uh, condemning their citizens to death and has taken two straight up hostages. And Canada is still a little bit worried about offending China. You know, so, so I, I really think that make it loud, do it at the UN General Assembly, put that narrative out there so that that narrative and those arguments are always in the room, whether you're in a back room with an American or a Chinese diplomat. Again, I know this is idealistic. I just can't think of a better idea. Thank you. Thank you, Zepton. Well, we, we always, you know, have told them and keep telling them that both relationships are very important for Peru because both are our main economic partners and, you know, right. our main cooperating partners. So, so we hope, you know, it will keep working. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Ambassador Galarreta. Thanks, Mr. Robile. We have some questions, but just before the, the question, yes, tell me a, a question for you. You said something very interesting. Uh, countries should unite to present a uh, in front and not to be pressured individually by either China or the uh, United States. But for example, in, in Asia, I think that perhaps uh, in the case of Asian countries, they could take, they can take advantage of the confrontation between China and United States to have more <laughs> of each other. Uh, so that's a very interesting perspective also. Okay? Mm -hmm. Anyway, okay. We have several questions. Let me ask you, for example, in from our Zoom room. They said, from your experience and from historical point of view, what is the consequence of the this mismanagement in development on science and technology? And then a following question said, I would like to know what is the role of India and Japan on relationship in, mili in military and economics terms, I guess, between United States and China. Or anyway, the, the role of Japan and China in this confrontation. Okay. That's sure. The so uh, science and technology, sort of s and this is one of the areas in which, um, you know, even though nations don't want to choose between the two countries, if separate systems and technologies evolve that are mutually exclusive, that forces a choice. So if you have separate standards on artificial intelligence, on 5G, operating over different cables, um, if you have different internets, uh, that, and, and if the United States and China don't allow any mixture of the two, then the, the choice is going to be forced. The same thing can happen financially. Uh, China is uh, increasingly interested in part because the United States has motivated it, to develop its own separate payment system as an option to the SWIFT system. So the SWIFT system of, of global payments uh, has been largely sort of overseen by the United States. But now that the United States is using the SWIFT system to impose sanctions on other countries and try to coerce, say, China's relations with Iran or Canada's with Cubans. Actually, we've incentivized other countries to set up alternate financial systems and payment systems. So these pressures can end up forcing choices, whether you intend them or not, right? This, this is where the, the choice is going to be forced. Um, in the case of science and technology, you know, we see, and I, I, as, as you know, we have the emergence of, of 5G, and I think probably 5G, the claims of 5G are probably overblown. 
okay? The claims of artificial intelligence are to date overblown, but we, necess we do see the confluence of, you know, things like nanotechnology, quantum physics and quantum computing, with AI, with 5G and 6G, and our ability to tie all of that into people's individual behavior, uh, their purchases, their social media, and even into their individual genomes. We know this is coming, right? And these are profound changes, which again, touch on the idea of the human, human rights. Um, what is the relationship going to be between individual human beings, sovereign nation states, corporations, and technologies that can comprehend and use all of this? These are, these are human questions that, that we all face, no matter what country we're in. China is going to have a very different set of answers, which is going to tend to favor, not in every case, but it's going to be about state power and state control in the name of security. Uh, the West's answer, we don't know, but it's easy to imagine separate systems evolving here, not only because of these different values, but also because of the element of corporate competition. Uh, neither China nor, it's not really just America, it's China and not China. <laughs> neither China nor not China is going to be willing to accept a system that regulates the confluence of these technologies. If that system is dominated by not China, China won't accept it. And if it's dominated by China, not China won't accept it. This is where ideology becomes very, very real. Um, and this again is where I think international voices are more are needed. Uh, but it's you know it's happening now. And I say that the, the, the Chile uh, Trans-Pacific Cable case is is an interesting case here. Um, so technology is one of the and the way that these systems evolve can force a choice because you'll have an evolution of different systems based on different conceptions of the human, but also great power politics and commercial concerns. So I think s and is, is the one to watch. You know, India and Japan, together with Australia and the United States, what is sometimes called the Quad, are strengthening the interoperability of their militaries through various joint exercises and purchases. And this is all about China. Uh, but this is, but the Quad cooperation is also limited. You know, Japan, while unquestionably America's most vital ally, you know, Japan and South Korea in East Asia, Japan and South Korea also have to hedge because of the proximity of China. So they value the relationship highly. Uh, but they're not going to go along with Secretary of State Pompeo and st simply sticking a finger in China's eye. Uh, they have a strong interest in the alliance, but they also have other interests vis-a-vis -vis China. So the, these quad relations are growing and strengthening, but there are limits on them. I would say just as China's cooperation with Russia is also growing, but there are limits on it. Uh, Australia and Japan are a little bit different in that they are American treaty allies and there's really very little question that if their a, a choice was forced upon them, they would be on the American side if we have to speak in absolute terms. India is a far more complicated case. Uh, India is, of course, deeply worried uh, about China as the two great Asian civilization states, nuclear neighbors with a, a serious border dispute. Uh, and so India has perhaps been leaning a little bit more the United States way. But India is absolutely not going to allow its relationship with the United States to be a subset of America's competition with China. And so if America pushes too hard, uh, it will lose Indian support, not gain it. So uh, yes, these relationships are strengthening, but that is a tentative process. Um, this is one of the reasons that it's so surprising that China would push the way it has been on the border uh, with India, because it does tend to push India against some very deep-seated Indian inclinations to maintain neutrality more toward the United States. This appears, I think this is a you know, big mistake on China's part. Thanks, Professor Dali. We have also some question on the Facebook page. One of these is, uh, in this confrontation between China and United States, 
what is the position of other countries? For example, Brazil, Russia, they have the BRICS. Do you think as this group could gain more economic and geopolitical power, how they will fit in this confrontation between uh, China and, and United States? And then uh, a question together with this is, how do you think uh, about the fact that Russia might have the first vaccine? Does this will affect the United States and China hegemony in the world, the global order? Um so BRICS, I'm, I'm one of those, you know, who thinks that BRICS uh, is an acronym in search of a purpose. Uh, there, there, there's really no such thing as BRICS. It's a, it's a clever acronym. Uh, but, you know, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, uh, this is not a coherent grouping uh, in any way. You know, what Brazil does vis-a-vis -vis China, it will do bilaterally based on its interests, as will South Africa, India, and Russia. So uh, BRICS, I, I, I don't see really as much more than an acronym. Uh, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which brings in Russia and the Central Asian states, but also interestingly, India and Pakistan, uh, that is a, a somewhat more coherent grouping that bears watching uh, because there are common economic interests there and there's also geographic proximity. So I think that from China's point of view, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization uh, is a better institution for actually exercising some Chinese regional power. But again, you've got both India and Pakistan in okay. there. So how does that uh, make sense? You also have very different approaches to China in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan than in, say, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, uh, and Turkmenistan. So, um, you know, I, I, think, I think that the Shanghai Cooperation Organization bears some attention from the rest of the world. BRICS, I'm not sure that it does. Uh, the Russian vaccine, uh, it's, it hasn't gone through the proper kinds of trials. Uh, I think that uh, now there's a chance that it's the miracle vaccine, in which case, great. Um, but right now, it smells like desperation. It, it frankly seems like a desperate ploy. Uh, Russia early on was smug and dishonest uh, about coronavirus when it appeared that Russia wasn't under threat. And then it took off like gangbusters. And it's you know one of the many things that's been handled very badly um, in Russia. And so for now, this looks like desperation. Um, Unless, unless it's a great vaccine, you know? So if, if, if the Russians have the vaccine uh, that saves the world from this, then congratulations and thank you, Russia. What else can one possibly say? Uh, but we're not there yet. So I, I, I wouldn't, um, it, it's much too soon even to wonder whether this will say increase uh, Russia's soft power. I, I think that, that's premature. Uh, that said, it's very clear that nobody really understands this pandemic very well. And I think that we should be very glad to get a truly you know, useful vaccine, no matter where it comes from. Yeah, okay, uh, another question. They said, what Latin America can do to protect and decrease the damage, the damage that, uh, damage if the China-United States relation uh, became more confrontational? Another, another question, is United States looking for a new consensus in the world? Um, I think we sort of talked about what Latin America can do, can do. I think with the rest of the world, again, make your concerns public and constant and unequivocal. And again, don't. it's not about criticizing China or the United States. It's about criticizing the mismanagement of that relationship as a threat to peace and prosperity. So, you know, don't let America, if, if you raise this at the UN, you know, America's going to want to talk about, you know, its defense of sovereignty and freedom, and China is going to want to talk about the community of common destiny, which Xi Jinping talks about a lot, and which means exactly nothing. What on earth does the community of common destiny mean? I, I, I don't know. You know, it's, it's, it's really a kind of a loud, aggressive airing of your concerns, which are shared all over the world, 
stop being passive, stop being quiet, and put it out there. It will help you, in my view, to hedge between the two of them. Uh, and the second question is the United States looking for you know, a sort of a global consensus? Yes, obviously Pompeo has been saying this constantly, uh, but they're not going to get it. And one of the reasons they're not going to get a global consensus uh, is because there has been a almost, the, the nature of the Trump administration's critique against China shows an almost comical lack of self-knowledge and introspection um, in, in, in many regards. You know, the, the, the Trump administration has been offending many of its allies, has been so deeply self-interested, sort of conducting this assault of all against all and denying American leadership. And now suddenly it wants to reclaim that mantle. Uh, so that's, that's one problem. Another problem with the Trump administration's critique of China is, I, and, and this is a big one, is almost everything that the Trump administration says as a criticism of China, almost everything that it says is true. All of its warnings are worth listening to, even when they're overstated. Um, but the critique of China is true. But what the Trump administration doesn't talk about is China's success. Of course, it's a very complicated story. So it's right about what's wrong with China, but it ignores China's strengths. You know, so for example, we can, we can warn that China has gone from authoritarianism to techno-totalitarianism. I think that's true. It's becoming a surveillance state. So this sounds Orwellian, right? It sounds terrifying. But if you go to China, what do you see? Do you see people skulking in the streets in fear? No, you don't. You find tremendous pride in China's accomplishments. You find optimism, creativity, internationalism, an entrepreneurial spirit, and a wholly admirable energy, which actually through trade has been good for a great many other countries. So because the Trump administration is painting China only as the evil empire, based only on the worst things you can say about China, which are true, you end up, it's not convincing because other nations see China in its entirety and in its complexity, good, bad, and indifferent. And an American China policy or American China propaganda that is based only on the worst things you can say about China will not be convincing. It's like Chinese propaganda that's only about the worst things you can say about America. The worst things you can say about America are pretty bad. But it's not all there is to say about America. You have to look at all the wonderful, vibrant, creative things too. So this is, yes, they, they are seeking a global consensus, but I, they, they cannot get it in this way. Um, but lastly, and then I would say that China actually has been hurting its own cause. You know, every time you, if it's people like me who tend to be seen as moderates, and historically I've engaged with China. If you want to make the case for more engagement with China, China's going to do some other damn egregious thing that makes it even harder to make that case, vis-a-vis -vis the Uyghurs or the South China Sea or Taiwan or Hong Kong or the arresting of dissidents. You know that there really has been a string of increasingly bad news out of Xi Jinping's China, and educated Chinese know it and are deeply concerned. So this isn't all about the United States. There are real concerns that the Chinese people share about the direction that Xi Jinping is taking the country in domestically and internationally. So no easy answers. Thanks, Professor. Is there another question by the members of our Zoom room? Well, time is, is, is approaching anyway. I want to ask you a question. I guess in a sense you answered it, but anyway, you have told us uh, about the possibilities, the possible outcome if Joe Biden is elected president, perhaps not rhetorically, not so confrontational. But what about China? Do you think that China, if Joe Biden is elected president, will continue, as some people say, this assertive or confrontational policy, or just China also will back up? How is the future, do you see, China's relation with the United States? I, I, I don't think... I don't think that China will change its behavior or its ambitions or the way that it pursues its ambitions because Joe Biden becomes president. The question for China is, does China de decide to change based on its own interests? 
Uh, most of Chinese domestic economists have been disappointed that Xi Jinping abandoned the reform blueprint laid out in 2013. Many Chinese economists would like to see Xi Jinping get back onto the road of reform, including political reform. But those decisions will be made by China based on Chinese factors, not on American factors or international factors. They will make those decisions on their own. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, a, a, a last question, I guess. There is a question I said, I would like to know, I'm not sorry, I know, I, it was about the role of India and, and Japan. It, it is over the question, Professor. Yeah. Okay, Professor, one. really, thanks very much. You have taken a lot of your time. I know you are very busy, especially this day. I want to thank you again, and I want to say perhaps there will be a chance again to ask you, for example, what will after the election of the new president, perhaps sure. we can have a talk about the new situation between China and the United States. Thanks well, so much. Thank you, Professor Aquino. I'm, I'm really honored to meet with all of you, and I'd be very, very glad to do it again. Just, you know where to find me, send me an email. Thanks, Professor, and you were very kind to answer very quickly to our request for a conference. Thanks, Professor, and thanks for everybody. Don't forget that this Friday 14, we have a conference about India, and on Monday 17, we have a conference you, uh, by you, Professor, I, I guess, I, but I guess you know it already, about China political system with a professor from Purdue University. Thanks, Professor. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Take care. Gracias, Juan. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Thank you. Gracias, Carlos. Gracias. Chao. Gracias, Mahora. Gracias a todos, amigos. Gracias. Gracias, Dr. Aquina. Fíjense, muchas gracias. Gracias por su el... presencia. Estuvo bueno. interesantísimo. Los esperamos el viernes y el lunes. ¿eh? <ríe> Están bueno, conectados. Bueno, va a estar muy interesante. Está Nico, gracias. también de Unicam, profesor. <ríe> de Brasil. Sí, sí. Gracias, gracias. Gracias a todos.